And go. Okay. So can a scientist believe in God? Uh, in this video we're going to use uh, arguments from Christian apologetics to try to tackle this issue. Now Christian apologetics is sort of an academic sort of field uh, that attempts to defend the Christian faith rationally. Uh, I'll be using arguments from Christian apologetics in an, in an attempt to convince uh, you that it's not unreasonable to believe in God. Moreover, it is unscientific for someone like Richard Dawkins to feel certain about his atheism. But why bother watching this video? You've probably already come to a conclusion uh, about this matter. You've had your whole life to do it, and watching this video isn't just going to change your opinion. Um, so there's no need to investigate further. However, I'd say you can never investigate this topic enough. Uh, C.S. Lewis would agree with me. He said that Christianity, if false, is of no importance, and if true, is of infinite importance. What it cannot be is moderately important. Uh, so, if, it's, if it could be infinitely important, as a scientist, you have to uh, investigate this claim. So what do scientists do? They examine the evidence and make conclusions based off of it. So if this is the most important question, why don't we all study the evidence thoroughly? Well, unless we're theologians, we probably don't have time. If you do have time, I've included many recommended books and uh, links and videos in the description. Uh, which go into detail, uh, but I haven't read them yet. So that's why I'm giving a brief overview of each argument that I've heard about. Um, so you don't need to do loads of reading. So if you were to go into loads of depth, I think you'd find that the arguments neither prove nor dis... Well, then you can't reach a certain conclusion, uh, but they have led many arguments uh, many academic philosophers to conclude uh, that God does exist. So hopefully my overview shows that at the very least it's not unscientific to believe in God. Um, so here are some of the greatest scientific minds in history. You've got Descartes, Newton, Kepler, Copernicus, all of these people uh, and all of them would have called themselves Christians. Maybe you could say they were influenced by their culture at the time, but maybe they were also influenced by some of the arguments that I'm about to present. So let's start with the classical arguments. Uh, these are philosophical arguments which seem to suggest that God must exist. Academic philosopher William Lane Craig gives a brief overview of each uh, in the links in the description. Uh, but I've also given another link where Craig goes into lots of detail, um, including giving Richard Dawkins' response uh, to each one. So Craig actually commends Richard Dawkins for being one of the only new atheists to address these arguments. Uh, but... I think you might find that his counter-arguments are generally quite weak. So, let's start with the cosmological argument. So, whatever begins to exist has a, co has a cause. We know this just from our own experience of the universe. The universe began to exist. There's lots of evidence to support this claim, like if the universe had existed for an infinite time, energy would have reached its highest entropy state. As we know, it hasn't reached its high highest entropy state. Um, we know that entropy increases over time, yet we live in a very complex, high entropy world. Uh, so, that must mean that the universe has a cause, uh, the core concept of God is this timeless, beginningless cause, so God must exist. 
Um, now, I think Dawkins scrambles a little bit when he tries to argue against this. He doesn't actually deny the premises. Uh, he just denies that this timeless, beginningless cause is God, without actually specifying what that cause is. Um, so the next argument is the ontological argument. I'm not going to go into much detail because I don't really understand this one that much. Um, but basically, if God's existence is even possible, the assumed nature of God uh, suggests he must exist. And it's quite easy to argue that God can exist, therefore God does exist. You can look into that more if you're interested. Uh, next, the design argument, or the fine-tuning argument. You may have heard uh, the argument like, the eye is so complex, it can't have evolved by natural selection. Uh, but I think this argument is a little stronger than that. So the universe is fine-tuned for intelligent life. From my understanding, this means that the basic constants of life, um, you know, the, the constants that you find in physics and chemistry, are in just the right range to allow for intelligent life. Uh, if they were any of them were outside of this range, intelligent life would be impossible. So this could just be um, a coincidence. It could be down to physical necessity. There's a theory for everything uh, that suggests that the universe had to be this way. Or it could be due to design, an intelligent mind behind the cosmos. So. Physical necessity is incredibly implausible, as the physical constants are independent from the laws of nature. So that's quite uh, scientific. I don't know that much about it, but that's what I've heard. Um, it can't be due to chance, because it's way too improbable. Uh, just take one uh, physical constant, for example. Uh, the probability that the Big Bang's low entropy condition uh, existing by chance is 1 in 1,010,123. So that's just for one of these sort of constants. Very implausible. Dawkins attempts to use the multiverse to uh, explain this, but I, the idea of Occam's razor, that the simplest answer must be correct, uh, presents real challenges to his response. Uh, so, if it's not due to chance or necessity, it must be a designer. And finally, the moral argument. Uh, so, if God doesn't exist, I think we can all agree that objective moral values and duties don't exist. Morality, if God didn't exist, would be subjective. And they'd only exist due to biological evolution and social conditioning. This is what Dawkins claims to believe, uh, but at the same time, he is a renowned moralist, uh, condemning homophobia, for example. But if it is only his subjective opinion that homophobia is wrong, then in objective reality, Homophobia is neither right or wrong, um, since no objective values exist. So this contradiction in Dawkins' logic, um, to me, implies that objective moral values do exist, uh, and therefore God must exist. Uh, so, those are the classical arguments for God's existence, but to me, the strongest argument is the evidence, uh, the historical evidence of Christian of Jesus's resurrection. Uh, if Jesus did re really rise from the dead, that changes everything, doesn't it? God must exist. Uh, a former professor of history described the event as the best attested fact in history. Um, I heard this in a video made by Alpha. Uh, and I've linked it below because it's another great way to inspect the evidence uh, without having to do loads of reading.
So whilst this quote is obviously debatable, uh, my point is that the resurrection is a reliably sourced event. Uh, and I hold this view because of listening to a lecture by a guy called Gary Habermas, another advocate for Christian apologetics. His talk you can wa watch online also. Um, and he says that in order for an accounted event to be reliable in ancient history, um, you must have early eyewitnesses who agree with each other. Uh, and this is sort of a standard that we use in history. Even the most uh, sceptical historians agree that Jesus' resurrection surely must tick both of these boxes, uh, since even they would agree with the approximate dates of events in this timeline that I've created. Now remember, the dates in this timeline are about the latest that they could be. Uh, we'll be down in a second, Mum! I'm a just going Shelly, you didn't stop it, did you? Okay, cool. Can we be down in two seconds? <laughs> Please? Where's Joe? He's here. No, the other Joe. He wasn't here, you know? Yeah, he's here. He never came up here. Where is he? Could you shut the door, Mum? You haven't looked after, you're not looking after your friends. Okay, we'll be, we'll be over in five minutes. Okay, let's do this fast. Um, so, yes, they're the latest that they could possibly be, really. A lot of people would say that most of these dates are earlier than in my timeline here. Uh, so, um, less than one year after the resurrection, you get your first creedal statements. That's super early. Then three years after the death of Jesus, uh, Paul has his experience on the road to Damascus where, uh, according to him, Jesus appeared to him. Then three years after that, Paul goes on his first trip to Jerusalem, where he spends two weeks with Peter and James, hearing their accounts of what happened. To me, Peter and James are the most significant figures. Uh, they'd known him their whole lives, they'd followed him, and Jesus appeared to both after the resurrection. So they're both eyewitnesses, and they were both executed for their faith. I'll talk about why that's significant in a second. Uh, so Paul preaches this gospel that he's heard. He goes around and he's setting up churches, and then he returns to Jerusalem 14 years later. Uh, and in his first letter to the Corinthians, he reports uh, on this trip to Jerusalem. Uh, he says that he met with Peter, James, and John, uh, so we've got our four main eyewitnesses at this meeting. John is actually another follower of Jesus and another eyewitness. Uh, and Paul reports that they had nothing to add to his gospel, which means all these early eyewitnesses agreed with each other. And it was around this time where Paul writes most of his letters, and James writes his, and Peter writes his two letters as well. Uh, so. This is sources that the actual eyewitnesses have written themselves, uh, which is especially reliable. And then after that, you get the four Gospels, Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John. John written 65 years after the death, and John, as I mentioned, is an eyewitness. Uh, so, can we trust the New Testament? Can we trust... Uh, Corinthians, James, Peter, Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John. Uh, well, even the most atheistic historians will trust it as a source. After all, where did these dates come from? Uh, they, they came from the New Testament. And the reason that these historians refer to the New Testament is because they, uh, there are early eyewitnesses which agree with each other. So, to give some perspective, the earliest book about Alexander the Great was written just short of 300 years after his death. Now, Alexander's life uh, forms a significant part of accepted ancient history. Uh, so, it's, this is reliable. 
So a lot of people will say that uh, that 65 years when John was written is too late. But I mean, you've got all these earlier events as well. And 65 years compared with the 300 years is nothing. Uh, now, you might also say the New Testament was written by Christians who were prejudiced. But the authors of these first written records of Alexander the Great were very prejudiced. They definitely had an agenda. They were pro-Greek and anti-Persian. But then again, you might say the New Testament was written by religious people, so you can't trust religious people to be rational. But we trust the people who wrote this source, these sources, uh, and they believed that Alexander the Great was born of a virgin and was the son of gods. So we trust them because of early eyewitnesses that agree with each other. And particularly, I mean, if this is classed as uh, reliable, then this must be too. Um, so with all of that in mind, Dawkins might still have a, th a few things to say about it. Not too long left, Joe. Um, he might say something like, almost done, almost done. What's more likely, a man, uh, supposedly the son of God, is actually risen from the dead, or Peter, James, John, and Paul were power... It's not almost done. It is. Look how much is here. We've uh, got guests waiting. Okay, okay. Peter, James, John, and Paul were power-hungry manipulators who made it all up. Um, so Richard Dawkins would say that the latter one is more probable, or even that Jesus survived the crucifixion. After hearing the evidence in the timeline I just showed you, I don't think this is a very strong response. If they were making it up, why would they risk their lives for it, preaching the gospel? Peter, James, and Paul were executed for it, and Peter was actually crucified, uh, but asked to be crucified upside down, so as not to um, be on the same status as Jesus, who he believed was much greater than him. Also, um, I don't think it's likely that he survived the crucifixion, uh, because there's only one person in history who has been reported to survive crucifixion. Uh, so Jesus's survival is very unlikely, especially considering uh, it's reported that he was a, th a spear was thrust into his side afterwards. So that is the uh, apologetic arguments for uh, belief in God. Now, many theologians argue that personal spiritual experiences are the main reason for belief. Rational arguments such as those that I've presented are not necessary. Uh, I think this is true for me. I've been brought up as a Christian, so my experiences with other people and with God are the main reason I believe. Uh, when I read the Gospel, I can't explain why, but it, it, I just believe it and base my relationship with God around it uh, through prayer, worship and daily life, uh, whatever that may be. I'd agree with C.S. Lewis when he said that uh, I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen, not just because I see it, but because I see everything else by it. Um, however, other people, uh, for other people, rational arguments are more important to them, so they need to know that the belief is rational before they can enter that relationship. One of these people is Francis Collins, uh, who was a great scientist who led the Human uh, Genome Project. Uh, and in the video made by Alpha, he tells about how he'd been an atheist his whole life because he thought that the belief was irrational. Uh, he realised that he had made this conclusion without actually looking at the evidence. And when he did, he came to the conclusion that the belief wasn't actually irrational. And that's when he could enter into a relationship with God, and now he'd call himself a Christian. So, in conclusion, uh, this video has been designed for people like him who want to know whether the Christian faith is rational. I've attempted to present evidence for the existence of God without basing my arguments on assumed biblical truth. I don't think there exists evidence which actually disproves the existence of God, 
Uh, scientific evidence for the Big Bang, for example, changed our ideas on the history of the universe. Uh, the philosophical question, why do bad things happen to good people, presents a mystery about the nature of God, but neither actually disproves the, the existence of God. Hopefully then the evidence that I've presented has convinced you that the belief in God is, at the very least, reasonable. Thank you, Joe. Why now?